Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to this webinar hosted by the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Without further ado, here's Christine Cortides. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us today for the second in a series of webinars hosted by ONDCP on new psychoactive substances. The first webinar, which was held last April, covered NPS-related health risks, NPS manufacturing and distribution, and federal enforcement and regulatory provisions to help reduce the availability of NPS. Today, recognizing that several states, municipalities, and local communities have taken significant actions to reduce sales of NPS, we are highlighting strategies Iowa, Washington, D.C., and Northampton, Massachusetts have used to reduce NPS use and availability. Um, but first, I'm going to give a brief overview of NPS. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but before I do that, let me just note that the Office of National Drug Control Policy is a component of the Executive Office of the President. We coordinate drug control activities related to, uh, and related funding across the federal government. We develop the annual National Drug Control Strategy and also the National Drug Control Budget. Uh, and we administer two programs, the Drug Free Community Support Program and the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Areas Program. Next slide, please. So, new psychoactive substances, synthetic cannabinoids such as K2, synthetic cathinones known as bath salts, synthetic hallucinogenics like the N-bombs, and opioids like MT45 are a global phenomenon. These chemical compounds are designed or manufactured to have psychoactive effects often using chemicals that are not controlled under the Controlled Substances Act. Reducing and preventing the use and availability of these dangerous chemicals is a concern for the administration. Next slide, please. Almost all new psychoactive substances are manufactured or synthesized in China, and they're sold online and in stores in the United States. They're usually marketed to mask their intended use with statements on the packaging such as not for human consumption or for novelty use only. Suppliers aggressively market these substances to young people in particular using logos and patterns drawn from popular culture. Suppliers often describe the substances falsely as safe or legal alternatives to traditional illicit drugs. Worldwide, the market for new psychoactive substances is one of the most rapidly evolving. Next slide, please. Uh, for example, um, the um, UNODC assesses uh, that there were over, assessed in 2013, that there were over uh, 350 new psychoactive substances. Today, the number is much higher. Um, next slide, please. With as many as 400 having been identified by the Drug Enforcement Administration as being available in the United States. Next slide, please. We don't know as much as we would like to about the use of these drugs in the general population. We do know from surveys such as the Monitoring the Future study, which looks at 8th, 10th, and 12th grade students. Um, we know that it, synthetic cannabis among seniors uh, in, uh, excuse me, synthetic cannabis use among seniors in 2014 uh, had nearly 6% of seniors reporting use of synthetic cannabis in the past year. That is actually half of its peak level, which was reported in 2012. MTS survey also added questions about past year use of synthetic cathinones, the bath salts, among 8th, 10th, and 12th uh, graders. They added that question in 2011. Uh, and so we know, for example, that in 2014, use of bath salts or the synthetic cathinones were less than 1% for any of these three grades. On the other hand, um, according to the American Association of Poison Control Centers, counts for synthetic cannabinoids were at a high in 2011 with almost 7,000 cases reported. These steadily decreased until 2015. As of November 30th of this year, over 7,000 cases were reported, with 2,700 reported in April and May 2015 alone. To get a better understanding of use trends, ONDCP funded a pilot study in 2013 that looked at justice-related populations. 
the results from the study indicated that synthetic cannabinoids were as likely to be found in persons who had initially tested positive for marijuana, cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, or PCP as in persons who had initially not tested positive for these drugs. Next slide, please. The study was replicated in 2015. Among the findings is that the synthetic cannabinoids that were detected had changed significantly in the, in the years since the study had been done, and that the types of synthetic cannabinoids detected vary significantly from site to site. The study attests to the value of expanding testing of specimens already collected by, for example, the local criminal justice system, drug testing programs, and also to the difficulties inherent in keeping up with the constantly evolving nature of NPS, or new psychoactive substances. Next slide, please. It's also likely that programs using similar protocols to test, for example, urine samples in other contexts, like schools and hospitals and treatment programs, are not aware of the synthetic cannabinoid use in these populations, which leads to lost opportunities for diagnosis and, and intervention. So testing is clearly an issue, and I'm very happy that uh, DC is going to be discussing that in their program today. Next slide, please. Regardless of how use rates for new psychoactive substances compare with use of some traditional illicit drugs, the risk to health can be very significant, including serious injury and even death. Users cannot be sure of the chemical makeup of new psychoactive substances. The content can vary significantly from batch to batch, so the effects of a product can vary significantly. They can contain toxic impurities, byproducts, or adulterants. As I mentioned, the packaging of these products are intentionally mislabeled very often. Synthetic cannabinoids are used, can be used uh, by a smoking using pipes, joints, or vaping, and they can even be drunk as an infusion. The effects include increased heart rate, vomiting, kidney injury, hallucinations, panic attacks, persistent psychosis, and even death. In the synthetic uh, cathinones, the method of use is also oral ingestion, snorting, or, or intravenous injection. The effects include increased heart rate and blood pressure, hypothermia, agitation, delirium, psychosis, and death. Next slide, please. At the federal level, we're working throughout the country. Uh, sorry, next slide. At the federal level, we're working throughout the country as well as regionally and internationally to address the dynamic problem of new psychoactive substances. Through directives and our national strategies and action plans related to reducing drug use and its consequences, we're working closely with China and other countries where these chemicals are produced to address manufacturing. We're working regionally with organizations such as CCAD and international organizations like the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the International Narcotics Control Board, and the World Health Organization to reduce the supply of these substances, with Congress to improve regulatory tools to schedule new psychoactive substances, law enforcement to support their investigations both domestically and abroad, science and the research community to better understand the pharmacology of these substances and to develop antagonists to counteract their toxic effects, researchers and demographers to better understand use trends, and prevention partners to inform communities about the dangers of new psychoactive substances and to share information about how to reduce their use and availability at the state, local, and community level. Next slide, please. So today we are here to learn about the significant, significant work being done to reduce uh, new psychoactive substances uh, by Iowa, Washington, D.C., and a community coalition in Northampton, Massachusetts, funded by the Drug-Free Community Support Program. Joining us to share these strategies is Mr. Dale Woolery, Ms. Michelle Ta, and Mr. Paul McNeil and, and Ananda Lennox. Mr. Woolery joined the Iowa Governor's Office of Drug Control Policy in 1994. As the agency's associate director, he works with public and private sector leaders at the local, state, and federal level to strengthen drug control efforts. In addition to coordinating drug enforcement and substance abuse prevention and treatment initiatives throughout Iowa, the Governor's Office of Drug Control Policy supports programs with federal drug and crime control grants and works with elected officials on public policy. A graduate of University of Minnesota, Missouri with a bachelor of, degree, a bachelor of Journalism degree. Mr. Woolery is married, a father of three, and a grandfather of four. We'll now turn to Mr. Woolery, and I'll just note one more time that we'll hear all the presentations, and then we'll open the line for questions. Mr. Woolery? 
Thank you, Christine. Glad to be with you today. Uh, I'll take a few minutes to share a little bit about the Iowa experience on NPS, or as we call them, synthetic drugs. But uh, on the NPS, we've learned a lot from other states, so uh, I, I think our experience has been similar. Uh, we've had similar struggles and maybe some similar successes. At any rate, uh, we'll get going here with the next slide, and uh, I'll give you just a synopsis here of kind of the timeline. And what's happened with the NPS in Iowa has happened in a relatively short period of time, uh, faster than just about anything you know we can remember. Here in Iowa, in the heartland of, the, of America, uh, typically we're used to drug trends starting on one coast or the other, or maybe both but taking time to work their career. This has not been the case with NPS because uh, it hit here fast and hard. And another one of the many things that were different about this experience and continue to be different uh, when we were first getting reports in 2010 of uh, the NPS uh, being in Iowa, uh, we started scheduling uh, through emergency action by our pharmacy board uh, these compounds as Schedule One controlled substances before uh, the DEA or the federal government did, which was, again, uh, unusual. Uh, typically, we follow the federal lead when it comes to classifying controlled substances. Uh, as you can see there in the timeline, uh, it was June of 2010, when things really hit hard here, we had a, the death of a teenager. That, as it turns out, became a rallying point because the parents of David Rosga of Indianola um, really took that, and uh, they've been huge champions and advocates for change, and I'll talk more about that a little later. As you can see there, we worked uh, through regulation, legislation, education, uh, and uh, as of now, we have 64 different, primarily synthetic cannabinoid and synthetic cathinone compounds that are Schedule I controlled substances uh, with another uh, 14 or so pending uh, in legislation that will be proposed this coming session. So it's, it is the proverbial whack-a-mole game. Uh, thankfully, we've had many, many partners in this. Uh, and as I'll show you on, on the strategy on the next slide, uh, we've tried to come at this from a comprehensive standpoint, um, and, and we do this with many uh, different substances, but with this one in particular, uh, we needed to work prevention angles, uh, treatment and enforcement, but first and foremost has been the prevention and specifically the education because the legislation has been unable to keep up. Um, we continue to face many challenges. Uh, what are the names of these substances? What do we call them? Uh, how do we detect their use? Uh, what are the health effects? The science hasn't really caught up with us on that. We, we are beginning to know some things, but in, the, in 2010 uh, or 20, even 2012, there were a lot of unknowns. Um, addictive qualities, we had suspicions, weren't sure. Uh, what's the prevalence? Since it's difficult to detect, uh, we, we, we found ourselves flying uh, relatively blind, if you will. And, um, and then trying to get legislation in place, uh, it seemed like uh, it was Groundhog's Day on many occasions because we were back to the legislature asking them to do what they thought they had already done the year before. They're not used to having to do or redo legislation like that. So... We hear about speed reading. Uh, this has kind of been an experience in speed prevention and education where uh, we had to act, we felt, before we knew too much about what we were acting on. Next slide, please. So in the realm of prevention, uh, I include a lot of different things in here. Uh, I think important, um, I, among other things, finding champions. Uh, and we had the parents of a young person who tragically died as a result of his synthetic cannabinoid use, uh, and they were willing to go public, and that meant a whole lot when it came to creating awareness and uh, educating not only the public but prof 
professionals, policymakers, etc. Uh, the media jumped on this. This was one of those relatively easy things to get media buy-in on because it was new, different, and presented uh, confrontational challenges. So. Uh, the media actually uh, were allies uh, on many occasions in educating the public. Retailers, 99% uh, of them were supportive. Uh, it was the 1% uh, who were selling to uh, reap profits that uh, were problematic. We appealed to uh, ethics of retailers and also to help educate. And uh, data we've struggled with, uh, we just recently started asking if Iowa youth are using these substances. And in 2014, 1% said they were. So a relatively small number, something we didn't know before 2014, didn't even know uh, to ask the question before then. Next slide, please. And this is just going to be a snapshot of uh, part of a media campaign a poster that we did uh, trying to convey that uh, though the drugs may be uh, manufactured by humans, uh, the threat's just as real as some of the other illicit substances that people are more familiar with. Next slide, please. Treatment challenges uh, that we faced were less, I think, in the area of substance abuse or treatment or treatment of substance use disorders more in the emergency department of hospitals. Uh, that's where we saw this present with teenagers showing up um, very ill. And doctors and nurses not knowing in the beginning how to treat that, let alone what they were dealing with. The Poison Control Center in Iowa was a huge resource and continues to be a huge resource, valuable resource on this issue, not only in terms of data, but also training and education of the professionals who needed to know on that front line in those emergency rooms. They were the leading edge uh, of this storm, if you will, uh, and also in providing education uh, and awareness for the uh, general public. Next slide, please. In terms of the data I just mentioned, uh, this chart is somewhat uh, illustrative of what we think has been happening in Iowa as it relates to the prevalence of NPS uh, and the SINCAN and CATH references to synthetic cannabinoids and synthetic cathinones. I apologize for the shorthand. Uh, as you can see, uh, we went from zero and then we jumped and peaked in 2011, 2012, and then we've been coming down. But uh, while I believe this is somewhat illustrative, we know that it is imperfect and inaccurate to the degree that these are healthcare facilities reporting, and since we do not have mandatory reporting, uh, we know that the doctors and nurses and emergency departments that were calling the poison center initially asking, what do we have on our hands and what do we do, they no longer call. So. Uh, some of that decrease is simply because there are fewer calls. Next slide, please. The enforcement piece, um, there were four basic components. The traditional criminal justice uh, regulation, and we actually had a great deal of help from alcohol, tobacco, and lottery uh, regulators as they would do their inspections in retail outlets. Uh, they were good eyes and ears for us, too, and for, uh, for those who enforce drug laws. Uh, the civil action is something I know other states have done, um, and our attorney general here filed suit, uh, won a case, won a judgment, and uh, I, I think hitting retailers who persisted in selling this in the pocketbook was probably a huge victory. And uh, I, I think it's been very helpful in reducing the number of sales outlets. Uh, we also were fortunate to have a, an appeals court ruling in our state that essentially held uh, that a clause in current law that talks about the equivalent to marijuana, including synthetic, synthetic equivalents uh, as it relates to synthetic cannabinoids, that uh, that also uh, basically put a lot of those compounds that we didn't know the names of until it was too late in some cases, it put those off limits. Uh, we've struggled with 
how do we throw a blanket over all of these different compounds uh, before we know their names, uh, that was helpful. And then uh, continuing with legislative efforts to outlaw the specific compounds and classes. Next, please. Again, this will be illustrative, but not necessarily uh, the total picture, but the Iowa Crime Lab is seeing many fewer submissions from law enforcement of these NPS uh, products. So we think that uh, is symptomatic of uh, an overall reduction, uh, but again, they only know what they see. Next, please. On the media work, uh, we uh, engaged the services of Iowa's First Lady, Chris Branstad, uh, an emergency room physician, uh, Tom McAuliffe. Uh, we appealed to parents primarily to do in the home uh, what was going to be difficult to do anywhere else, talk with kids about, uh, you know, if you don't know what it is, don't do it. And for sale does not mean safe to use. That kind of became the watch phrase here uh, because we had so many confusing messages and it was so difficult to know, is it legal, is it illegal? It's for sale, so isn't it okay? Um, we tried to cut through that uh, with a simple message that this stuff we don't know much about, just stay away from it. And as you'll see in the next slide, this is actually just a, uh, just grab this photo from a, a video. This is the Rosga family, uh, and the young man in the Green Bay Packers cap is David Rosga. He's the one who died back in 2010, and that became the rallying point. His mom and dad there, Jan and Mike Rosga, and then his brother, Daniel, uh, they have been extremely strong advocates at the local, the state, and the federal level working with our, our elected officials uh, to get the strongest legislation possible, and they have been helpful beyond description on the education side, too. So those champions can really make a difference. Finally, um, the next slide is just kind of a listing of lessons learned. I won't go into all of those, but uh, I think one of my big takeaways is that uh, the speed with which this hit, uh, I think, teaches us a lesson that sometimes we, we, we need to be more efficient and, and quicker with our response. We need a rapid response uh, with new threats and to rally and marshal forces. Uh, I, hopefully we've learned from this that we can do that faster than we could before. Uh, we need to counter market and we kind of need to kind of cut through the clutter on the language and clarify the language because we need to take the complex and simplify it for the public, find the experts. In this case, uh, it was not only criminal experts at the crime lab, but poison center uh, experts uh, who could talk about uh, the products. We needed chemists. Uh, chemist. We needed experts in chemistry. And uh, wherever we went, especially with lawmakers, we needed someone who knew the chemistry. And we, we basically had to act now and adjust later based on what we might learn. And uh, we tried holding up the, uh, the models, the good retailers, uh, among other things, and, uh, and also just basically tried to change mindset on public policy because that battle fatigue point there at the bottom, uh, that's been a real barrier with policymakers. Um, the quote there is an actual is actually what one of the key lawmakers told us. Um, they're not typically in the business of undoing or redoing legislation every year. So our, the challenges still before us basically continue to be the detection issue. Uh, we, we still struggle with that. Uh, language issues, I think we've gotten better, but uh, we will continue to have those. Uh, data, we've never had real good data. Uh, we're, we're grateful for the data we've had. Uh, it's, it's difficult to collect data on things um, that are difficult to detect, measure, and even know are there. And then on policy, educating policymakers to know that this is a new day, this is a new set of substances, and so we're going to have to deal with it differently. Uh, it, it's basically 
an, an unconventional challenge that's going to require non-traditional responses. I'll leave it at that. I'll be happy to maybe answer questions later on. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. I thank everybody who's helped us in Iowa uh, try to deal with this, uh, with our response here. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dale. Next, we're going to hear from Ms. Michelle Ta. Ms. Ta joined the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council as a policy analyst in December of 2012. Her areas of focus at the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council include reentry, substance abuse, and mental health. She's also the project manager for the CJCC, Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, research locator. Prior to her current position, she served, uh, she practiced civil and criminal law as an associate attorney at Dudler, Topler, and Feuerzeug. She has also served as a law clerk to the Honorable James S. Carroll III, Judge of the Superior Court of the Virgin Islands. Ms. Ta received her uh, AB in politics and a certificate in African American studies from Princeton University in 2005 and her law degree from Georgetown University Law Center in 2000. She's licensed to practice law in Maryland and in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Ms. Ta? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, one quick note before I begin. You'll hear me refer to new psychoactive substances as synthetic drugs throughout my presentation because it is the ger generic name the district's officials have adopted in referring to these substances. CJCC is an independent agency dedicated to continually improving the administration of criminal justice in the city. CJCC's mission is to serve as a forum for identifying issues and their solutions, proposing actions, and facilitating cooperation that will improve public safety and the related criminal and juvenile justice services for the district's residents, visitors, victims, and offenders. CJCC draws upon local and federal agencies and individuals to develop recommendations and strategies for accomplishing this mission. Next slide. One of CJCC's priority areas is substance abuse and mental health, and CJCC formed a task force to address this topic. The purpose of CJCC's Substance Abuse Treatment and Mental Health Services Integration Task Force, also known as SAMHSA, is to, is, the SAMHSA, excuse me, is dedicated to interagency collaboration to improve the treatment options for criminal justice involved individuals with mental health issues, substance abuse problems, or co-occurring disorders. SAMHSA is composed of more than 20 local and federal agencies and organizations. CJCC's Synthetic Drugs Work Group, which I'll provide some detail about later in the presentation, is convened under the auspices of this body. Next slide, please. So to get on to the emergence of synthetic drugs in the district, in January of 2012, uh, the Metropolitan Police Department, also known as MPD, documented its first case of synthetic drug use. Three high school girls smoked synth a synthetic cannabinoid before school and arrived er behaving erratically and with elevated heart rates. Police and emergency medical services were called. Uh, and the business that sold the girls the drugs was eventually closed after an MPD investigation. Later that year, a family member of someone under the supervision of our Court Services and Offenders Supervision Agency raised concern that that individual was using synthetic uh, drugs to that person's supervision officer. The officer in turn raised that issue with the agency's director, who also chairs CJCC's SAMSIT, and proposed holding a forum to raise awareness about the issue in the district. That conversation led to the first of three symposia we've had here in the district. Next slide, please. In the interest of time, I won't belabor this information about the symposium. Materials for each of the symposia are linked on the slides um, or through CJCC's website, uh, which is cjcc.dc.gov. Each of the symposia aim to bring leaders from a variety of sectors, including public health, public safety, education, business, and science together to address this issue. 
The purpose of the first symposium was to raise awareness about the emergence of synthetic drug use in the district and also to generate a conversation that could lead towards a comprehensive and coordinated response. Next slide, please. Recommendations that arose from that first symposium were to develop legislation to ensure that synthetic drugs are illegal, create disincentives for retailers who sell synthetic drugs, develop and improve methods to detect synthetic drugs, and increase public awareness about synthetic drugs and its impact on the individuals who consume them. In order to implement these recommendations, CJCC formed the Synthetic Drugs Workgroup. Next slide, please. Uh, the purpose of the second symposium in July 2014 was to examine best practices around the country, report on the progress, progress and challenges that we've seen here in the district, and to continue developing response strategies. Recommendations that arose from that symposium were to increase youth involvement in these conversations, have more treatment options available, continue research, and employ a multidisciplinary approach. Next slide, please. Most recently, CJCC partnered with the Maryland Governor's Office of Crime Control and Prevention and the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services uh, to hold another symposium. Uh, recognizing the porosity of our borders in this region, this follow-up to the 2013 and 2014 symposia sought to highlight the importance of working together to address synthetic drugs across our jurisdictions, specific, specifically in our case, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. It's important that our response strategies balance both public health and public safety concerns around synthetics. Next slide, please. Recommendations from this most recent symposium uh, were to continue regional efforts to address this issue, including more collaboration between existing work groups, better and more consistent information sharing, uh, continued outreach targeting populations most at risk for using synthetics. Uh, those populations in our jurisdiction would include youth, uh, homeless and justice-involved individuals, and then improve, improving testing and changing the discourse around testing uh, to let the public know that we can test and we are testing uh, for synthetic drugs. Next slide, please. Although the symposia were great opportunities for learning and dialogue, it's really critical that we uh, continue our work on this topic throughout the year. Uh, to that end, CJCC formed the Synthetic Drugs Workgroup, which came into being as a result of the first symposium back in 2013. We needed a body that would be dedicated to this issue and to implementing the recommendations that arose from that first symposium, as well as any recommendations that came to light moving forward. Uh, to that end, the work group's priorities have largely remained constant uh, in the broad sense, although we've uh, refine certain aspects of it. Namely, the priorities are uh, legislation, keeping better pace with the rapidly changing uh, synthetic drugs landscape, research regarding the prevalence, uh, testing, medium and long-term effects of use, and the pharmacological properties, and coordination of information among federal and local agencies, uh, existing synthetic drugs work groups and task forces, and with the uh, public, especially, as I said, youth and other vulnerable populations. As an agency, CJCC's role is to bring all the right people to the table and create and facilitate an environment of collaboration. Our partners are the ones who truly have a pulse on the community because they're the ones providing the direct services every day. Uh, so moving along, um, I would like to talk a little bit about the work that our partners have been engaged in over the past few years. 
Um, first up is the Right Choice Campaign, which is a product of D.C.'s Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. Uh, this is the agency in the district that licenses retail businesses, and it has the power to administer civil penalties, including the revocation of business licenses. Um, and that is adjudicated through our Office of Administrative Hearings. Uh, in the middle of 2014, DCRA uh, promulgated regulations aimed at uh, synthetic drugs in the district. And the aim of these regulations was to hold business owners, rather than their employees, responsible for the sale of synthetic drugs. This, these regulations ban substances on the basis of packaging, marketing, promoted use, and the effects of the products rather than the chemical composition of the compounds that are contained in the products. Uh, there, and the, the penalties prescribed under these regulations uh, were progressive that, and they could ultimately lead uh, to the revocation of a business license. Uh, you'll notice the asterisk next to penalties. Uh, that's because the penalties listed on this slide are the original penalties laid out in the reg regulations and have subsequently uh, been revised. And I'll talk a bit more about that in my discussion about the legislation uh, in a later slide. So about the Right Choice campaign, uh, it was a three-phase effort focusing on education, uh, a publicity campaign to let the public know about these efforts, um, informing businesses about the penalties for selling synthetic drugs, and also leveraging the existing K2 Zombie DC campaign in educating the public about the dangers of synthetics. The second phase was engagement, uh, which involved issuing regulatory alerts, reaching out to community organizations and government offices, especially those who were able to reach business owners and their, or their employees, and getting businesses to sign pledge letters stating that the business owner is aware that synthetic drugs are illegal and harmful and pledging not to sell them in their stores. The final phase was the enforcement phase, uh, which involved finding businesses, suspending or revoking business licenses uh, for any business that sold synthetic drugs. And a key component of this phase uh, harkens back to the second phase, is that the uh, pledge letters put as evidence um, in the civil proceedings against uh, the business owners to indicate that they knew what they were selling uh, was illegal and harmful. DCRA successfully revoked its first business license for the sale of synthetic drugs in February of 2015 uh, and has started a number of other cases. Hundreds of businesses throughout the city, I think the number tops 300, uh, have signed the pledge acknowledging the dangers of synthetics uh, and community members can identify stores that have signed the pledge by stickers that are on display in the stores. Uh, community members can also report stores that are selling synthetic drugs by calling our local 311 number and this anonymously. Next slide, please. Along the lines of the education that I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, in 2013, D.C.'s Department of Behavioral Health K2 Zombie DC campaign was launched. Uh, this campaign was designed to educate youth ages 12 to 16 and their parents about the dangers of synthetic drug use. This particular age range was targeted uh, because at the time a DC prevention center report indicated that the average age of a synthetic cannabinoid user in the district was 13 and a half years old. Uh, the campaign has won nine national advertising and public relations award, and DBH is in the process of updating this campaign and looking to potentially include additional messaging targeted more towards some of the other at-risk populations for using synthetic drugs, which would be the homeless population and justice-involved populations. The campaign utilizes an array of media, including print ads, a website, and social media to reach young people 
and you can check out uh, the website at www.k2zombiedc.com. Next slide, please. Moving on to some of the legislative efforts that have been underway in the district. Uh, the sale of Synthetic Drugs Amendment Act of 2016, or 2015, excuse me, was enacted on an emergency basis in July of 2015 and is in the process of becoming permanent. Uh, penalties, as I mentioned uh, in my previous slide concerning the Right Choice Campaign, uh, the penalties for violating um, the regulations around selling synthetic drugs uh, include that a business can be sealed for up to 96 hours by MPD for a first violation and fined up to $10,000. DCRA may also issue a notice to revoke all licenses issued to a licensee, not just the license for the particular business that has been selling synthetic drugs. And then the business has 14 days to submit a remediation plan subject to approval by MPD. For a second violation, businesses uh, can be sealed for up to 30 days and subject to a $20,000 fine. Uh, with that potential uh, penalty, licensees are entitled to request an administrative hearing within two business days of the closure and the Office of Administrative Hearings must have a hearing within two business days of a timely request and issue a, a decision within two days of that hearing. So the process moves fairly quickly. Uh, product characteristics listed as causing concern uh, or raising red flags uh, in the Sale of Synthetic Drugs Amendment Act are those that are not suitable for marketed use, i.e. something that's uh, labeled window cleaner that wouldn't actually clean windows, um, a store selling something that it does not usually sell, uh, for instance, a liquor store selling plant food, um, something that includes a warning label not typically included on such products, as in you have to be 18 years or older to purchase incense, um, a product that costs too much, uh, multiple times a reasonable price for such a product, uh, if the product resembles illicit drugs, and if the store that's selling the product has been previously warned uh, by a government agency about the illegality of a particular substance. Next slide, please. The second piece of legislation is the Safe DC Act. It stands for the Synthetics Abatement and Full Enforcement Drug Control Amendment Act of 2015. It was introduced last month by the chairman of the DC Council at the request of our Office of the Attorney General. And the act uh, criminalizes synthetic drugs based on the class of chemical compound. This is in contrast to uh, scheduling which Label, which schedules the particular compound, this looks more broadly to the class of the chemical compound. Um, and it also codifies other district regulations uh, regarding synthetic drugs. This piece of legislation is a product of the OAG's Emerging Drugs Trends, Emerging Drug Trends Task Force in collaboration with the Department of Forensic Sciences and other local and federal government partners. Benefits to this uh, particular law would be to minimize the necessity of enumerating specific synthetic drug compounds on the DC Uniform Control Substances list. Um, it makes lab testing for synthetic drugs more efficient, uh, and law enforcement will not need to rely on an impractical controlled substances analog statute to prosecute uh, emerging drugs, which is really helpful, um, as Dale mentioned in his presentation, for uh, substances that change very, very rapidly. And again, it codifies uh, current reg regulations. Next slide, please. On the testing front, um, as our pretrial services agency for the District of Columbia worked to 
build its testing capacity. It partnered with the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner to test uh, urine samples of individuals who may have used synthetic cannabinoids. Although this partnership will continue, pretrial has now acquired a liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometer, also known as the LCMS-MS machine, which will allow uh, it to do in-house testing for synthetic drugs. Since it's acquired uh, that machine um, and effective October 1st of this year, now PSA's Office of Forensic Toxic has added a new initial screening test to its panel of drugs. All incoming specimens, and those would be specimens from the pretrial, probation, parole, supervised release, and family court populations, will receive an additional screening in PSA labs for the presence of today's more commonly used synthetic cannabinoids uh, in the district. Um, in the district, those two have been pretty consistent uh, for the past couple of years as we've been testing, and that would be XLR11 and UR144. The addition of this new screening test is intended to rapidly determine if a urine specimen contains one or more of the targeted synthetic cannabinoids. Um, if there is reason to believe that an individual is using another synthetic drug, either they self-report or uh, there is some other clear indicia, PSA will conduct a more enhanced screening of the collected sample. Uh, also, the Department of Health recently adopted emergency regulations requir requiring um, requiring uh, area hospitals to collect urine samples from patients with signs and symptoms of synthetic drug overdose after they have arrived in the emergency rooms. The regulations also recommend that clinicians take blood samples from these patients, but that's not required. Hospitals then send these samples to um, OCME, uh, our chief medical examiner, for testing. And we hope to use the data collected from these samples uh, to determine prevalence of synthetic drug use in the district as well as the location of synthetic drug use in the district in order to form a more, for, a better targeted responses to this issue. Next slide, please. On the law enforcement front, the Metropolitan Police Department's Narcotics and Special Investigations Division conducts criminal enforcement operations related to synthetic drugs, including street level enforcement, store inspections, and investigations. NSID also works with DCRA to conduct compliance checks of businesses to di disrupt the sale of uh, synthetics and NSID partners with federal law enforcement as well as state and local agencies and the Postal Service to conduct investigations involving synthetic drug trafficking uh, in the district. One of uh, the hallmarks of this collaboration uh, happened on September 1st of this year. MPD sees 116 kilograms, which translates to 19,000 packets and more than 260 pounds of a, the synthetic drug Bizarro coming from a warehouse in Maryland, uh, which was intended for sale uh, in stores and on the streets of the District of Columbia. The estimated street value for this seizure was $2.3 million. Uh, to get the ball rolling on that seizure, Maryland State Police tipped off MPD that the shipment was coming and MPD, Homeland Security Investigations, and the Drug Enforcement Administration teamed up to conduct the raid. Next slide, please. It's really hard to capture all the effort uh, our partners have undertaken. Um, however, some major takeaways from the district's experience are the importance of partnerships and collaborations amongst agencies and across sectors. Uh, the importance of information sharing with other agencies, organizations, and the public at large, um, the importance of research, and the importance of being very vigilant with respect to this issue. Next slide. 
Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Todd. We're now going to hear from Mr. Paul McNeil and Ananda Lennox. Ms. Ananda Lennox. Mr. McNeil joined the Northampton Prevention Coalition as its coordinator in June 2014. The Northampton Prevention Coalition, or NPC, is both a drug-free communities and STOP Act grant award recipient. Previously, Mr. McNeil coordinated the Pittsfield Prevention Partnership after nearly a decade in direct service as a youth development specialist. NPC's mission is to collaboratively initiate, coordinate, and sustain prevention and intervention efforts that reduce teen substance use in the city of Northampton, Massachusetts, by working together with students, parents, and other community members to make Northampton a drug and alcohol-free zone for youth. A graduate of Hobart and William Smith Colleges with a degree in English and education, Mr. McNeil is earning now his, his Master's in Public Health at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Ms. Ananda Lennox joined the Northampton Prevention Coalition in 2013 as their first youth engagement coordinator. Her work is project-oriented and defined by integrating self-expression and advocacy designed to promote healthy decision-making and community engagement amongst teens. Ms. Lennox earned her BA in psychology, Master's of Education, and Education Specialist degrees at University of Massachusetts Amherst. She's also the mother of three little boys. Uh, Paul and Ananda, over to you. Thank you. Uh, we are excited to share what we've been doing at the very local level. We've heard a lot of uh, what's happening sort of bigger picture federally and at the state level uh, and even in the nation's capital. But we're, yeah, we're a city of about 28,000, um, and we jumped right into uh, what we saw as the major problem in Northampton. Uh, in the last few years, we, we finally saw some data showing that students had been using uh, new psychoactive substances. Um, we do this, annual, this uh, biannual survey to get a good glimpse uh, of what our substances are being, of, are being used locally and what the, the chief substances to focus on preventing and decreasing use are. Um, the question as it stood on the survey was, how many occasions, if any, have you used synthetic drugs such as K2 spice or bath salts during the past 30 days. We had three eighth graders uh, reporting use of at least one to three times in the last month, and we had one tenth grader reporting a little more use at three to five times in the last month. And this data matched up with our youth focus groups that we carry out each year as well. Next slide, please. So how did we respond? Well, we piggybacked with existing health inspections. Our local health department carries out two health inspections a year of local merchants that are permitted to sell food products or uh, prepared or, or packaged, and they gauge local retail availability of new psychoactive substances now because we asked them to, uh, which was a great partnership to take advantage of. So our, our local health inspectors uh, use this spreadsheet to track who, what substances are available currently, uh, and we'll use this spreadsheet every year as a sort of foundational backbone of you know, how much is available now compared to uh, in years past. So we, we tested for herbal psychoactive substances, salvia and kratom, which are both uh, legal and not synthetic, um, bath salts, which are illegal, blue silk, ivory waves, stardust, vanilla sky, and synthetic cannabinoids, K2 spice, Mr. Smiley Blaze. We also were looking at uh, where paraphernalia was available in the city of Northampton, uh, bongs, pipes, hookahs, and vape pens and vaping accessories, et cetera. Of the 30 establishments surveyed, only two places in Northampton sold new psychoactive substances, and those were salvia and kratom, neither of which are an illegal synthetic substance, again, despite their recreational use for psychoactive effects. Eight establishments did sell bongs, pipes, and or hookahs, uh, smoking paraphernalia. Next slide, please. So what did we do next? This is when I turn it over to Ananda Lennox, our incredible youth engagement coordinator. Thank you, Paul. So um, on a local level, as Paul had mentioned, we're in a, a smaller city, and so we're always looking for hands-on work that we can do, and as a youth engagement officer, what we can do with students. So <clears throat> back on April 30th, I conducted a purchase survey of eight local retailers who had already been identified as shops that sold salvia, kratom, hookahs, bongs, pipes, and vaping products. And the purpose of the survey was multi-pronged. First off, um, we do surveys on a regular basis anyhow for alcohol and have been doing so for years. We continue to do those, but for this purchase survey, we wanted to investigate how retailers were handling NPS, 
smoke paraphernalia and vaping products. I knew from my youth engagement work that the criminal justice students at Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School were very interested in conducting a purchase survey and that their instructor and department head, Fran Henderson, was interested in augmenting their law and ordinances and public safety curriculum with experiential projects. So asking them to participate was a natural choice. What you're seeing in front of you right now is an example of the template that the students would use when they would enter a store. They would have to take notes just as if they were an actual police officer with the type of retail outlet they entered, what they attempted to purchase, and then characteristics of the clerk that waited on them in case there was any um, commendation that we wanted to give after the fact or a written warning depending on what they attempted to buy. Um, from there, um, Paul has suggested that we follow up on the work that the Board of Health had done to identify retailers who sold alternatives to marijuana. So after many calls back and forth with the local police department and research on salvia and kratom, we decided to conduct this survey as a tobacco purchase survey, for we learned that there were no laws controlling who could purchase salvia or kratom, and that even though many people purchased bongs for marijuana use, if they were for sale in a tobacco shop, they were legal to sell. We also wanted to ensure that these retailers did not, in any form, have K2 or spice, for even though the Board of Health had already done a check, we kept hearing about how quickly it could become a victim of it. Of it, especially since through our surveys we've learned that some of our students were actually using them. So though the greatness of the laws and ordinances were tricky to work with, it was very helpful for the students to have an opportunity to see how complex the system can be and to see firsthand the importance of staying up to date on the frequent changes that can happen. Next slide, please. The good news about our survey is that of the eight retailers that we went and surveyed, all of them refused to sell any products to these teens. The teens at the time were a group of seven. They went in in small groups of two or three, and they were all approximately 15 years of age. So tobacco shops, as you know, you have, well, at least in Massachusetts, you need to be 18 or older to buy anything. But since Salvia and Kratom have no laws like that, it was really kind of a crapshoot to find out whether they would actually sell them or at least let them you know, view the products. And the good news is that despite the ambiguity around the laws, that all of these, these we know they would not sell them. Next slide, please. So as part of this survey, just before I get into why we did it, I wanted to point out the cards that you're seeing on the page. Um, since part of doing a purchase survey has a strong educational component, we made sure that we had cards made up that gave information to the retailers about the penalties surrounded around selling any kind of tobacco product to anybody who is underage. So this is an example of the card you would get if you actually failed um, and did sell. So um, first I want to kind of define a purchase survey for somebody who might not know, because um, again, on a local level, this is something that anyone can do and they could do it right now. So it would be a, what's happening in your community and educate people around the dangers of these NPSs. So an NPS purchase survey is not first and foremost a sting operation. There's no laws broken. Um, no underage child is actually trying to in actuality buy a product. They're just ask, asking a hypothetical question, you know, like, could I see this? How much is this? No money is exchanged and no purchase is made. Um, and probably one of the uh, greatest benefits we get out of it is that it raises awareness through education on possible penalties and harmful effects. And in most cases, um, especially in our area, since the retailers were all very good about preventing the sale to minors, it gives them um, public pr publicity. Um, we always send a thank you card when we're done with our survey. And we release a press release that lets the community know that the retailers in our area are concerned about teen health, health following all tobacco laws. Um, it also allows us to keep tabs on our prevention needs assessment survey data and compare trends in availability and use. Next slide, please. So despite all of this, there's still a lot of challenges. Um, one of the ones that we've mentioned a couple times already is that salvia and kratom are not only legal, but they're not synthetic. So these two substances were specifically identified by local law enforcement and health officials as being used by area teens to reduce the psychoactive high, yet they are legally available in retail outlets. It was also a bit difficult to explain to our youth leaders who carried out the compliance check that a lot of the products they were asking about were in fact legal. Um, when we were working with the criminal justice students, they were very excited at first to you know, kind of bust some people for doing the wrong thing. And in this instance, it was more about getting information about what retailers would and would not sell um, products were legal. 
Um, and it's also about collecting information on what MTS are named and what their ingredients are. They change quite frequently to avoid FDA regulation. So that's been mentioned before in previous present presentations, but it's true. It's just very difficult to keep up with it. Next. Thanks, Ananda. So feel free to connect with us. This is all of our social media handles. Uh, but if you also emailed myself or Ananda, we'd be glad to share any paperwork uh, we use to track availability and uh, purchasability of new psychoactive substances in our town. So we'll, we'd be glad to share any of that with any existing coalitions out there and prevention groups in, uh, in, on this call. And we'd love to share our resources, because it's something you can do uh, right now to assess what's available and how accessible is it for young people in your community. Thanks for having us. Thank you both very much. <coughs> Marilyn, if we can open the lines now for questions, we have a few minutes to take a few. All right, let's go to the line of Steve Shagrud. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Please go ahead. Uh, very, very good um, presentations. And uh, just uh, are the slides, slides going to be available that we can uh, send out to our prevention coordinators for HIDA and our Health and Human Services? Uh, Paul, this is Christine Cortese at ONDCP. Yes. Uh, for the uh, first webinar, for the current webinar, and for the webinar, we have a third one that's coming up. We will, we have packaged and will continue to package all of the presentations that are available. The first one is available on YouTube right now. It will take us about a week and a half to get these organized and up, and we'll also have them on our website. So those will be available for, for, uh, for future, future use by anybody interested. Uh, thank you. And just a quick comment: we we start we just finished our first prevention program that's HIDA sponsored for the kids in the Virgin Islands. We were successful on St. Croix and St. Thomas, and we'll we'll include St. John in the spring semester. It's not an initiative yet; it's still a pilot, but but looking very good. Uh, and uh, it's uh, just wanted to relay the stories we're hearing were similar to what I saw in, in a lot of the uh, slides here in terms of. Uh, uh, seventh and eighth graders, a lot of them have already been drunk, uh, not a lot, but a fair amount, and a fewer amount, but still too many have have tried uh, marijuana. And so we've got to get to them earlier uh, in the spring, fifth and sixth graders, and some in the second and third grade that we're going to try to uh, reach out to. Thank you. Yeah, to your point about early, pre early prevention, it's, it's it's very important. Thank you for sharing that with us. All right, and let's go on to our next caller, the line of Christina Lloyd. Hello. Um, have you guys heard anything about Red Dawn, which is like they promote it like an energy drink, or um, Pegasus Fly Away, Any, anything like that? So um, ONDCP in Washington, D.C. are shaking our heads. We're not familiar with either of those, uh, but perhaps okay. uh, perhaps Iowa or, uh, or, or North Hampton have, um, have come across that. Okay. Um, I work, one of my prevention staff is actually part-time up on our mental health unit here in Aberdeen, and she was telling me that someone had come in and had this energy drink that they got at the local, um, for the lack of novelty store, I should say. And he was saying that apparently there's several different kinds of energy drinks. One's supposed to be like um, painkiller in a bottle, and another one, they're supposed to give you different effects. And I know Red Dawn was one, Pegasus Flyaway was another one, um, but they're again promoting like an energy drink. So I don't know. Thank all you for the, flagging that for us. Yep. I don't well, know all the details. Thank you for that for us. Yep. We'll keep an eye out for it and do a little bit of research uh, on it to see uh, how it's being, where, where it's available, and how it's being marketed. Thank you. 
Uh, Marilyn, I think we have time for one more question, if there are any more to take. We do have another one. Uh, let's go to the line of Arlene Pitchford. Arlene, please go ahead. Your line is unmuted. Okay, um, let's go on to our next caller, Bertha Madras. Please go ahead. Yes, um, good, good morning, and good afternoon. Thank you for this webinar. I'm wondering with regard to the, some of these programs which were presented, if there is at the level of ONDCP a strategic plan for incorporating prevention, um, public awareness, as well as the legal status of these compounds. Uh, because what I do not see yet is a strategic plan uh, based on this webinar. And my second question is with regard to DC, how does the um, prevention outreach um, dovetail with the legalization of marijuana? In the eyes of youth, do they see a distinction or a differentiation? And can the public outreach and education with regard to the synthetic cannabinoids be compromised by the fact that uh, marijuana is illegal? Uh, thank you for that, uh, those questions, Dr. Madras. Um, I'm going to respond. Uh, this is Christine Cortides at ONDCP. I'll respond to the first bit uh, related to ONDCP and federal efforts and then turn it over to Ms. Toff for DC. I'll just note that, um, that our, so a few things. Uh, first of all, in the first webinar that was that in our series, we uh, discussed federal efforts and federal priorities around reducing use and availability of new psychoactive substances. That webinar is available as a package on YouTube, and it's on the links are on our website. In it, there is information about uh, the work that we're undertaking, uh, moving that we have currently undertaken and areas that we've identified that require some further work. I'll just mention a couple of them. I think chief among them are surveillance. Uh, we know that it is uh, imperative to get better data around the use of new psychoactive substances so that we can better target our resources around user populations. Uh, so, and education. We've noted that edu uh, increasing awareness about the dangers of new psychoactive substance is, is very, very important to, the, to, our, to our work. And so to that end, just by way of examples, we're doing these webinars. We're also in the process of developing a toolkit uh, that can be used uh, for uh, community uh, members, parents, preventionists to help them better understand what is and what is not going on with new psychoactive substances. I think one of our uh, speakers, uh, well, several of them, Dale in particular, mentioned that there's a lot of confusion about, uh, about the status and the safety of using these drugs because some of them are not expressly uh, controlled in the United States. Uh, and then lastly, I'll just mention that um, both the Drug Enforcement, so the Drug Enforcement Administration has noted that um, in addition to opioid issues, new psychoactive substances are among their uh, major concerns, and ONDCP has had in our uh, national drug control strategy items, actual directives related to reducing use and availability of new psychoactive substances in our latest uh, iteration of the National Drug Control Strategy, which was released a few weeks ago, uh, we have actually included uh, new action items associated with NPS uh, directly in part as a recognition of the dangers of this uh, evolving threat. I'll also note that uh, there were 697 DFC-funded community co that are also doing work at the local level to educate and collect data around NPS. So I think I'll leave it at that uh, and turn it over to Ms. Ta for the DC piece. But I, I thank you for pointing out the, the, um, the, the need to have a coordinated uh, federal approach to, to, to reducing the availability and use of these substances. Okay. So to get to your question uh, specifically about um, how prevention outreach around uh, synthetic drugs dovetails with the legalization of marijuana in the district. We've certainly been around all our various tables concerned about that. Um, and one of the, the things, the first things we noted was how we talk about uh, synthetic drugs. 
Uh, so getting away from calling it fake weed, synthetic marijuana, making sure that uh, that kids in the book in general know that these two things are not at all uh, similar, which is part of what the Department of Behavioral Health is looking to do uh, in updating uh, its outreach, uh, its K2 Zombie educational campaign. Uh, DBH is also working on an educational campaign around marijuana legalization, uh, particularly in the district, uh, to make sure that individuals are clear about what the law does and does not permit and also targeting specifically youth around uh, the continued dangers uh, in terms of their health and uh, de development with respect to uh, mm. marijuana use and the fact that the law does not permit youth to um, mm -hmm. use or purchase marijuana. Thank you. May I just follow up with a question? On what scientific basis do you say that the synthetic uh, cannabinoids are uh, very different than marijuana because the 80% butane hash oil could produce a number of the same symptoms as, um, as the synthetic cannabinoids. So I'm wondering if you're drawing a distinction that is based on science or based on uh, public policy. Um, well, I think some of this might have been covered in the initial uh, webinar that uh, that happened uh, a, a little while ago. Uh, but specifically, uh, this is based on the science. Although synthetic cannabinoids are designed to mimic the effects of marijuana, uh, there's not really um, any sort of regulation on that. They don't occur in nature, although synthetic cannabinoids are made up of plant products, uh, which may or, not act, may or may not actually be marijuana, and more often than not, they are not marijuana. Um, it's just random plant material. Uh, they're sprayed with chemicals that are changing all the time. There's no sort of regulation as to, um, you know, the amount of chemical that's sprayed on any one product or the number of compounds that are found in any one package. And so in that sense, it's, it's very different. Mm -hmm. Marilyn, I think that might be it for, for the for our time this afternoon. But uh, if there are additional questions, uh, ONDC can be contacted through our website, through our Office of Public Engagement contact information sheet, and we'd be happy to kind of continue this conversation uh, sort of offline with additional questions. Um, but for now, if I may, let me thank all of you for joining us today, and in particular thank our speakers for their presentations. Our goal today was to share state, local, and community strategies to reduce use and availability of new psychoactive substances, which include legislate well include a, a host of of, uh, of of strategies, not the least of which is legislation. We did hear some challenges associated with that, which made some of the other examples I think all the more uh, important, such as finding champions, the importance of public education, especially working with the retailers at the point of sale. Uh, we heard about clients about purchase surveys and about compliance checks. I think we also heard some common themes from our presenters, uh, among them the significance of partnerships and collaborations among sectors and across sectors, uh, particularly among the public health and the public safety communities, and also the importance and the need for uh, data, and as uh, Ms. Chen mentioned, vigilance in this, in this area. So let me just uh, uh, conclude by saying the webinar was recorded and will shortly be posted on YouTube. You'll also find the presentation on the ON website what we, where we have resources with more information about new psychoactive substances. I also hope you'll join us this spring when we'll hold the third webinar in our series. That webinar is going to focus on international cooperation to reduce the manufacture of new synthetic drugs and international control and scheduling. Um, I'll just note that as recently as March 2015 and for the first time in over a decade, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs and its role as a treaty body for the three United Nations Drug Control Conventions reviewed a number of narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances for control, and they took decisions to control the majority. Among, the, um, among, among those drugs were, two, uh, were 10 new synthetic drugs, including 25B N-bomb-E, 25C N-bomb-E, and 25-1 uh, N-bomb-E.
International scheduling is the first step for many countries to control these substances domestically and a significant step forward in reducing their availability. So we'll learn more about these efforts and other international collaborations in this third webinar. Uh, the Office of National Drug Control Policy will send out information about these webinars shortly. So I think that will conclude our efforts this afternoon. Thank you again for joining us today, and goodbye.